despite just a little bit of rain out there. My name is Dave Houle, and I'm a longtime member of the Forum on Tolerance, and I'm here to welcome you to our 40th Forum. Yep, 40th Forum on Tolerance. Our forums began back in the mid-1990s and have tackled issues around race, gender, age, religion, particularly anti-Semitism, also issues around gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender issues, particularly homophobia, heterosexism, and gender identity and expression. We've also dialogued about women's issues, immigrants, hope, peace, reconciliation, bullying, genocide, hate, political correctness, respect, inclusion, and forgiveness. So we've done quite a bit of work over the years. Our forums were instituted by a man who has been and continues to be very much loved by all of us here at North Shore Community College, our professor emeritus, Dr. Sheldon Brown, who happens to be sitting right there in the front row. Would you stand, Sheldon? And Dr. Brown has been a champion of social justice issues from the very beginning, and we are happy to have him here with us tonight. Continuing in Dr. Brown's footsteps is current English professor, Dr. Laurie Carlson. Laurie, you are somewhere. There you are. All right. And it's through Laurie's hard work and persistence that we are here tonight. Now behind Dr. Laurie Carlson, there's been a team of people serving on the Forum on Tolerance Committee. If you've ever been part of this team, we invite you to stand and be recognized. Yay, Carl. All right. Excellent. Now here tonight to introduce our forum is North Shore Community College's Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Karen Hynek. Dr. Hynek has been North Shore Community College's Vice President of Academic Affairs for almost four years now. And this topic, the topic that we're talking about tonight on respect and inclusion, building hate-free communities, is truly near and dear to her heart. As an advocate for diversity and equity, she has championed the college's National Coalition Building Institute, or NCBI, program, which provides interactive diversity work, both in the classroom and beyond. And she has also worked to bring cultural competency training to North Shore Community College. Now, a little while ago, she was in Minnesota, and back when she was in Minnesota, she was an active participant in Minneapolis's YMCA program, It's Time to Talk, which dealt with bridging courageous conversations on race and ethnicity. So it is truly my pleasure to welcome our Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Karen Hynek. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at this very important conversation. And again, I want to thank the entire forum steering committee that works on putting this event together. I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Attorney Joseph Berman. He's a national commissioner and regional board member of the Anti-Defamation League. He's currently the general counsel at the Board of Bars Overseers of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. He's received many honors for his over 25 years of legal work, including being elected one of the 100 best lawyers in New England, the President's Award from the Boston Bar Association for his pro bono litigation, and the David A. Rose Civil Rights Award and the Krupp Young Leadership Award. He received his Juris Doctorate in Law from the University of Michigan Law School and his bachelor's degree in History and English from Dartmouth College. He will be speaking with us tonight about the line between free speech and hate speech. And we will invite your questions after his conversation. Come on up. Thanks so much, Karen, and thank you all for um, inviting me here this evening um, for what is, I think, a very important topic um, and always a very timely topic, but maybe now more timely than ever. Um, 
I think we all recognize um, these images from last summer, um, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which was a terrible and frightening um, event in our nation's history, something that I thought as I was growing up I would never see again, but unfortunately we all have. And the topic of my um, brief remarks tonight is the line between free speech and hate speech. And I wanted to show these pictures um, because I think they really provide a dramatic um, representation of the challenges that we face in a democracy in the United States of America when we try to balance um, two things that sometimes are, are in competition, and that is freedom and um, tolerance. And I think what you saw in Charlottesville and what we see um, you know, even in Massachusetts and in Boston and throughout the United States um, are things that challenge our notions of, of, of tolerance and make us think again about free speech. Um, but I think it's important to draw that line uh, between hate speech and free speech, which is the topic of my talk this evening, because I think there are certain core principles that, uh, that we need to remember. And I'm a lawyer, I'm going to try to resist the temptation to get too deep into the woods on law and cases and Supreme Court precedent, but I have to tell you, I have to warn you in advance, I'm not going to be able to avoid it entirely, uh, but I will try to keep it um, at a fairly high ge level of generality. Um, there are laws in this country, including in Massachusetts and 45 other states and in, f and in the federal government, um, that, make, that make hate acts a crime. We call them hate crimes. Um, and any crime that is motivated by bias or prejudice or bigotry is defined as a hate crime. And in Massachusetts, for example, or under federal law, um, if you're convicted of a hate crime, you as the defendant would be subject to enhanced penalties because of the bigotry um, uh, of your act. In general, however, despite that fairly narrow um, category of what we would define as a hate crime, most speech is protected under the First Amendment. Um, so hate incidents, things that are not quite hate crimes, um, are protected by the First Amendment, and they are not illegal. Um, there are, of course, exceptions to free speech. It's not a complete um, and total freedom, as we all know. Obscenity is an exception to free speech, defamation, invasion of privacy, harassment, incitement to violence. But hate speech, the speech like this, that, we, that so troubled us in Charlottesville last summer, is protected by the First Amendment. And I know that's a hard concept to get our minds around, um, but I think it's important. Because as, as, as hateful as this is, as much as it churns our stomach and makes us fearful for our friends and ourselves and our families, I think we have to recognize that this speech, this hateful, bigoted, awful speech, is protected under the First Amendment, and there are very good reasons why it is. Now, again, going into um, a little, again, a little bit of the law, which I apologize for, uh, the Supreme Court has confronted this issue on, on many occasions. A famous case called Brandenburg versus Ohio. Um, the Supreme Court back in the 1940s said that it is okay for a, a, for a legislature or the Congress to prohibit speech um, where the speech intentionally and efficiently asks people to immediately engage in, in, in a crime of violence. So if I were to say, you know, to speak into a, a crowd and there was somebody, a minority standing over here and to point to that person and say, let's go get him, that obviously would fall within that, what we call the incitement to violence um, rationale. But that's a fairly, again, narrow exception to, um, to, to free speech. Um, making a derogatory comment, for example, about somebody of the Sikh faith, Sikh faith because of that person's religion is protected speech. Displaying a Nazi flag in front of your house is protected speech. Writing derogatory posts about women on Facebook is protected speech. Sending a, sending a non-threatening but racist email is protected speech. And again, there are important reasons for that. 
But, and, and this is what's important, and this is where the line gets crossed, we have this line, um, if the conduct, if, if that speech crosses over into conduct, if the racist emails are repeated over and over again, every day or sometimes multiple times a day, then you could actually be talking about something that is conduct, and we can criminalize conduct. We don't criminalize thought, we don't criminalize speech, but conduct is criminal. And so what we have are situations where, you know, uh, for example, the single racist email um, may not be a violation of the law, but multiple racist emails directed at the same person day after day after day then gets into the area of harassment, of bullet bullying, uh, invasion of privacy perhaps, and then, um, then it becomes um, possibly a crime. I think maybe the best example of this, and, and again, the, 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 the speech for the, the events in Charlottesville are kind of lead into this, um, is cross burning. We're all familiar with cross burning. We've seen videos of it, um, Klan rallies from the 1920s, 1930s, and even recently. And as a general matter, of cross burning is obviously a hateful, powerful, awful expression um, of bigotry and racism. But it's protected speech in most instances. And again, I think people have you know, a hard time getting their, their, their minds around that. How can, we, how can our country say to the Ku Klux Klan, you have the right to burn a cross um, as part of your rallies? Well, Virginia, to its credit, and I don't know if other states that have done this, passed a law that, again, walked up that line between speech and conduct that is harassment. And Virginia passed a law that said that if the cross burning is directed at a specific person in order to cause that person to feel, or family, in the case of in Virginia, to feel or experience fear for their safety, then you are crossing into the area of criminal conduct. So what happened in, in, a, in a very famous case called um, Virginia versus Black, um, a cross was burned on, across the street from an African-American family in, in rural Virginia. And the evidence came out that it wasn't part of a political rally. This was an African-American family that had just moved to this town from California shortly before. And the obvious intent of, of this cross burning was to instill fear in this family of African-Americans. And under the Virginia statute, because it wasn't political speech, it was, it was aimed at causing fear, it had crossed that line between hate speech and free speech. And that is where I think we as a nation need to keep that line, is, is between those two, between conduct and expression. Um, the growth of social media has added, obviously, great potential for people to interact, but has also allowed um, the haters uh, to c come out from under their rocks and behind their walls um, and work online. Most social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, actually have codes of conduct. And again, these, these are private companies, so they are able to have a, a code of conduct that's not subject necessarily to the First Amendment. And um, I would urge you, if you know of people who are violating codes of conduct by engaging, for example, in racist speech on Facebook or Twitter, to call that to the attention of the company. And those companies will take that We'll take that down. We'll take that speech down. Universities, colleges such as um, where we are here are obviously um, subject to the First Amendment. Private colleges have their own separate codes of conduct, but um, colleges and universities are subject to the First Amendment. And I think we've all um, heard and read news stories in the newspaper and seen on TV a lot of incidents at universities and colleges across the country where um, right-wing bigots um, have come in and tried to speak on campus and it's led to, in some cases, out at, like for example, out of California, Berkeley, to riots. Um, and it, it's a whole host of problems and challenges that we as a free democracy have to confront. And I think what most colleges and universities realize, um, especially, certainly if they're public, right, they cannot 
discriminate on the basis of the viewpoint or the content of the person who seeks to speak. So when Richard Spencer, an avowed right, white supremacist, wants to speak at the University of Florida or the University of California, Berkeley, those universities cannot say to him, no, you can't speak here because we don't agree with your viewpoint or what you're going to say. They have to treat that person as they would anybody else who wants to come in from the outside and speak. They can put what we call time, place, and manner restrictions on the speech, um, but they can't, but those have to be um, enforced in a content neutral way. And those are real challenges, and as we're standing here at an, at an institution of higher learning, um, those are real challenges for, for educational environments. Because we want to be inclusive, we want to be tolerant, we want to and encourage a diverse student body, diverse faculty, and we want people to feel safe um, and where, where they are and where they're coming to learn. But at the same time, I think we live in a pluralistic society, people of all different faiths and backgrounds and viewpoints. And I think we have to realize that so much of what we do has to be grounded in that, in that sense of freedom of expression. So I would urge us, as we think about these things, to not try to stifle this speech. As much as we hate this speech, we can't get rid of it. You're never gonna get rid of that speech, and we can't as a constitutional matter, and that's what makes our country different maybe than any other country. And I don't think the answer is stifling speech. I think the answer is actually more speech. Um, as um, Justice Louis Brandeis said um, in another context, but I think it um, pertains here, sunlight is a great disinfectant. By shining more light on, on the haters, on the bigots, um, I think we can actually um, encourage conversations and encourage a more pluralistic society. There are always going to be people who are bigoted, who are narrow-minded. I'm, I'm, I hate to sound cynical about it, but that, 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 that's the reality. You're not going to get anywhere by stifling or cutting off their speech, but by countering their speech with other speech, we can, we can lessen its effect. The ACLU in, in the 1940s um, defended a man who um, was making all sorts of anti-Semitic and racist remarks, and they won that case. They used that case 30 years or 20 years later in the 1960s when they were defending the rights of civil rights protesters to protest. So by coming to the aid of um, somebody whose views are hateful, they actually set the precedent for, to protect the rights of those who were working for civil rights. And I think that's a really kind of beautiful um, coincidence in a way that they were able to do that. Um, because we, you know, we, we face these challenges every day. Our instinct is to say we want to shut this off. We don't want to look at the pictures like you see up on the screen. The unfortunate reality is that we need to be able to address it, not by cutting it off because you will never be able to do that, but by trying to drown them out, not necessarily by being louder than they are, but just by being more rational, more reasonable, and being more inclusive. So the line, I think, between hate speech and free speech is a narrow one. It's one that we want to cross by saying we want to outlaw hate speech, we want to do something to protect ourselves so we don't have to listen to this. But in fact, that line is very important. And as hard as it is to accept, that's part of the price that I think we pay here in living in the United States, living in a tolerant place um, such as Massachusetts. And I would urge all of us to respect that line um, and encourage us all to speak out and use our own First Amendment voices to speak about tolerance um, for all. Thanks very much. I was trying to avoid the questions by leaving the stage, but <laughs> I was prevented from doing that. <laughs> but maybe there are no questions. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it would fly in the U.S., and I think our history is so different from, from Germany's, and I think that they will, um, you know, I mean, what, what makes the United States unique, I think more than almost than any other country other than maybe Canada, <laughs> um, is this free and unfettered right of free speech. Even, you know, Britain doesn't even have a, a written constitution. Um, France has civil law. Um, so even the, you know, the European Western democracies um, that are closest to ours don't have quite the same um, freedom that we do. Their, their freedoms of speech and expression and assembly don't go as far as ours. Um, you know, I, I guess I don't want to, I think every country is unique. I don't want to comment on, on Germany, but I guess what I would say is I think understanding the unique history of the Holocaust, um, I think that, that makes, maybe it makes sense for Germany. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's, you know, um, maybe, maybe that makes sense. Now, um, next door in Poland, um, there's been a troubling um, development because it is now a crime, I believe, and hopefully I'll get this right, I think it is a crime in Poland to say that Poland was somehow, the Poles were somehow responsible and have shared responsibility with the Germans for the Holocaust. Uh, the official position of the Polish government was that you know, they were obviously conquered by Germany um, in the early days of World War II, and whatever assistance may have been given by Poles individually or, or in groups to the Germans and rounding up Jews and others and sending them to the death camps was, you know, not their responsibility. It's not the responsibility. And they actually have passed a law that says that if you say something against that, um, that can be a crime. I think that's a very troubling um, development for many, many reasons. Um, so I think, and you know, and I think, you know, you look at what's going on in a lot of European countries, Poland, Hungary, um, you know, where um, fairly, uh, what I want to say is right-wing intolerant governments have come to power and have really stifled free speech. I, on the radio coming up here this evening, I heard a story. Um, there are no newspapers in Hungary anymore that are not controlled by the state. They've shut down the, yesterday, they shut down the last independent Hungarian newspaper. Um, these are very troubling developments um, going on, you know, in countries that are, you know, now have been part of Western Europe. And I think, you know, that to me reinforces the importance of protecting freedom of the speech and freedom of the press. Any other questions? Great. Thank you all very much. So before we get, begin our next uh, segment, I did want to remind people, in case you didn't notice, that there is a resource table that exists off to the, well, I guess it would be your right, my left, that has some uh, good information about organizations that have resources around the topics uh, that we're discussing tonight. So now, uh, we move to the next segment of our Forum on Tolerance, and we have three individuals that are going to participate on a panel who have fought throughout their lives for social justice and inclusion for all. And so we'll invite them up in a second, but um, maybe as I call your name, if you could stand, that would be great. So uh, Reverend Andrew, Andre Bennett is the youth pastor at the Zion Baptist Church here in Lynn. Thank you, Reverend Bennett. He is a graduate of UMass and Endicott College and the Atlantic Coast Theological Seminary. Uh, and Reverend Bennett has a certificate and associate's degree in developmental disabilities, I believe, right here from North Shore Community College. So he is one of our own. He is an inspirational leader with the Essex County Community Organization, or ECCO, which is a diverse network of congregations and organizations across the North Shore that works really on, on building relationships and putting power to human dignity at the center of public life. Very important. 
And Reverend Bennett is a passionate social activist working with a number of local colleges and community organizations to improve the lives of immigrant communities and how important that is these days. So thank you. We also welcome tonight Jose Palma. And it is Palma, P-A-L-M-A, -A, it's not my New England accent. He is the legal program coordinator at Justice at Work, which provides legal resources to a network of work centers while training workers and organizers on their workplace rights and the mechanisms needed to realize them. Now, Jose was born in, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but I'll try it, Usulatan? Usulatan, Usulatan. Yes, El Salvador, and came to the United States in 1988. He has lived in Lynn since 2002. He is a North Shore grad with an associate's degree in paralegal studies, so another one of our own. And Jose has also been the political and organizing director for Neighbor to Neighbor and has worked with Central Presente and the student immigrant movement. He has been heavily involved in the effort to pass comprehensive immigration reform across the country. So we welcome you as well. And finally, we have a professor emeritus with us tonight, Sue Gerard. Susan Gerard, many of you know her. Now, some people, just some people, have called her a radical teacher, <laughs> a socialist, a feminist. And I know that Sue would be proud, very proud, of all of those terms. <laughs> a caring, devoted professor at North Shore Community College in the English department for more than 30 years, part as a department chair and also a member of the Emeriti Group. She has done a lot to advance the teaching profession, always challenging underlying assumptions and eloquently expressing what is needed to be said. She has been a lifelong political activist, and I'm sorry to say the year, Sue, but from 1962, when she joined the Civil Rights Movement in the South, to the anti-war movement, to the women's movement, and labor organizing. She has been an advocate for women on welfare, and in recent years, she has acted mainly on immigration rights issues, so we hear that theme over and over again, in her community. Many have run to Susan wanting to be just like her, while others have run scared in the other direction. <laughs> and tonight, we are very proud to have her here as part of the panel and reunited with her North Shore family. So let's all come up. Anybody want to volunteer to go first? Never give a Baptist preacher a mic. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, <laughs> I thought I was imagining faces. Um, on my way here, I looked for a quote that because um, I wanted to make sure I had the words correctly. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. And this is almost the, the base of the work that I do, the foundation of the work that I do. Um, Never in my life I thought a little boy from a third world country, an island in the Caribbean Sea, Jamaica, would, whoo, I heard that, <laughs> would someday be sitting on the panel next to the wonderful. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> um, But I have, I have 
some kids, um, four to be exact, um, two that I inherited when I got married many years ago, and two that my marriage produced. And I've always been the person that goes about my business. I do what I need to do to ensure that my family's okay, to ensure that I, my life is elevated in, in um, that I can live my best life. Um, I never once had to worry or think about uh, racial injustices. I grew up in a country where I've never filled out a form and, it's, uh, and, and, and one of the question is my ethnic background or my ethnicity. The first time I saw that on a, on a, form, um, a form that I was filling out, I was flabbergasted. I never understood why it's important for me to tick off whether I was black, white, pink, purple, or blue um, for anything at all. But then as I got more acclimated to the, the American lifestyle, and we all you know, want a piece of the American dream, and so obviously I didn't hesitate when my wife said, let's go to America 10 years ago. And we came here, and my first run-in with what it means to be an African-American, or as I consider myself, a black man, um, I oftentimes make the distinction between African-American and black, um, because currently I am not an American. Um, and I'm not an American citizen. I'm a permanent resident of the United States of America. But the first time I understood what it meant to be a black man living in America, in the city of Peabody, no less, I was on my way from church one Sunday, and my son, who at the time was six years old, locked the, 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 the key. We lived in an apartment building, and he locked the keys um, inside the house. And I didn't realize that. None of us knew that until we got home from church. And, uh, the apartment building that we lived in, of course, some of you may know, across the hallway is an apartment. Um, there's a little passage in between, and you're on one side. And I see my neighbor every day, religiously. I talk to my neighbor in the hallway. We, you know, we share little things here or there. But this particular Sunday, I knocked on my neighbor's door, and I said, oh, my son locked the keys in the house. Is there by any chance you have a knife? I could pry the door open. I could pry the lock open. And my neighbor said to me, hold on. And she went back inside. She locked the door. And I'm standing there holding on, because <laughs> I was told to hold on. And I noticed an extended period of time, of time went by, and she, she did not return. So as I was going down the stairs, because my wife and my son were outside waiting in the car, as I was going down the stairs, I heard sirens coming. And uh, three police cars raced onto the apartment complex. And I got out of the building just in time to hear um, a police officer asking my wife if she sees, if she saw a strange black man running away from the building. Well, clearly, <laughs> no, she didn't. Um, and I went about my way. <laughs> and the other guy that was in the car with this one, he came over to me and, um, he asked me where I was and where I'm coming from, what I was doing, and I explained. And before I could get the words out of my mouth, I was grabbed, I was thrown up against the car, I was down on the ground, and I was touched places that my wife sometimes don't touch me. And <clears throat> after you know, this continued for a few minutes, um, the, my wife naturally got angry, and. Um, the officer said, well, they received a call that a strange black man was trying to force himself inside a building with a knife. So I proceeded to explain to the police officer what had happened. Well, they asked questions as they should, you know, do we live here, whatever the situation was. Um, <clears throat> my wife has a tendency to travel with things that she doesn't need to travel with. Thank God she, did. she has that tendency on that particular Sunday. Because in the car, 
were our documents, our marriage certificate, the lease to the apartment, and luckily, all of that was in her car. And I always argue with her, why do you need to be traveling around with these things? But that was how I got released, actually, that evening. Uh, fast forward to 2016. I'm driving in my car, and the ruling came down about the Tamir Rice situation. And uh, my son is a very tall, but very quiet, soft-spoken young man. And he rarely says anything except, Daddy, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as the ruling came down um, that the police officers that were involved in the Tamir Rice shooting would not be indicted, my son, sitting in the back of the car, we were driving to rehearsal here in Lynn, Sitting in the back of the car, he said to me, he said, Daddy, they should just tell us that being black is a crime. That way we won't look for anything. And I, it's very difficult every time I share this story for my voice not to break. Because that was the first time in my life my son ever saw me cry. Because in that moment, I felt like I had done a great injustice to this child. I didn't have the words to tell him. I didn't know what to say to him. And I just knew that no father should ever be put in a position to hear his 12-year-old at the time, child, says this to him. And what's worse is I've always had some reassuring or comforting word for my kids. I, I couldn't come up with anything. And I started weeping bitterly in my car. And though I was, I've been involved in social justice work, I don't think I meant the work I was doing until that day. Because I knew that my child, my son at 35 years old, would never hear, if I have anything to say about it, would never hear his 12 or 13 year old son say that to him. He would never experience that pain. And I started asking myself a bunch of questions. I've always had questions about the civil rights era. And was it necessary? Was it worth it? Why, did we, why do we do it? And I'm going to shut up in a minute, I promise. Why do we do it? Why, you know, why did you know, Martin have to give up his life? And Rosa, you know, why? Why was it necessary? You see, I grew up in a country where I don't know what racism was. I don't know what that was. I never experienced that. We're all, most of us are black as night. Those who are not as black as night, they're close to being black as night. So we never had those issues. And so I could not relate. I, I came here, and in 2007, I believe it was, I started serving a predominantly black church, Zion Baptist Church, one of the oldest churches in Lynn. And I had two white members. One of them is sitting here with me, Miss Barbara, and somebody else. Everybody else in Zion Baptist Church is black or brown. And I used to stand in the pulpit and I, I would tell them, there is no black and white war. There is no black and white war. There is no black and white war. There is just good over evil. And you know all the good things that preachers say um, when we're emotional. <laughs> that's, that's what's happening. And if young men would just dress differently and get themselves educated and speak properly, and, and we, we would not see. And I realized I was being pulled over at every corner. I was being trailed in every store. I was being questioned. And I don't think it, the dress gets any better than this. And this is kind of what I look like <laughs> most times. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think it gets any more educated than how I've sought to educate myself. I don't think it's any more well-spoken than I do and, and the, the way I raise my kids. But I was still being targeted. And I realized real quickly, you're talking, you're talking garbage. You're telling these people garbage. And that's why you could not, I could not connect 
with my congregation for the first five years of my ministry there. I just couldn't connect with my congregation because I couldn't understand and relate to the struggles of my congregation. And as I delve into this work and I travel the country and I've had the esteemed privilege of traveling to almost every state in the United States of America for various reasons and meet with various people, I realize that there is a fundamental fear that drives the action of a great many in this nation. There is a fundamental fear that, 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 that blinds the eyes of a great many in this country. I struggle to find the answers. I struggle to strategize. How do we deal with this? I know I, I, I've been accused personally of not being black enough um, because I, it's a philosophy of mine that if you want to conquer hate, you first have to deal with your own hatred. You first have to deal with your personal biases. Um, and so we're at a place in this country where what we're seeing today is not new. It is nothing new. You see, uh, some time ago I preached a sermon at Zion Baptist Church about the bushes that have been burning. And, 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 and they didn't start with the 45th president of the United States of America. They didn't start with the 44th president of the United States of America. They've been burning for a number of years. Bushes have been burning in this country for a number of years. Kids have been suffering. Families have been suffering. Um, individuals have been suffering. Groups have been marginalized. Um, and m m my final point as I try, don't ever let a Baptist preacher speak <laughs> first. Um, don't do it. Just don't. Um, I, went to, I went to, upon invitation of the governor of uh, New Mexico some time ago, I went to, uh, uh, to, to New Mexico for a couple of days just to see how people are treated at the border. And I was flabbergasted when I walked into the federal court and I saw young men, 17 and 16. I have kids that are 24 and 23 years old. I saw young men, 17 and 16 and 20 years old, shackled, and I'm not talking about handcuffed, I'm talking about shackled from the neck, the waist, the hands, and the feet bound, because they're trying to cross over into this country in search of a better life. And as I listen to the, 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 the DA or the prosecutor or whatever their official title is, no disrespect to anyone, um, read the, 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 the charges against these individuals that they pick up overnight. And as I listen to the bargainings that are being made, we have, uh, in New Mexico, we have rapists and sex offenders that are being released just so they can house um, kids that are 16 and 17 years old who are trying to come into this country to seek a better life. And I personally believe it is because of how they look. They look different. Their accent is different. Their skin tone is different. There is a fundamental fear that is at the heart of the operation of this nation. And I, I struggle, like I say daily, on how we move forward. I struggle to see the path forward. Thank you. Hi. Um, gosh, I feel like um, I wanted to comment on a couple of the things that 
people had spoken about. Um, there used to be an old bumper sticker called Think Globally, Act Locally. And uh, I thought that was a really cool bumper sticker, but I never really did that until like the last maybe eight years of my life. And uh, when Dave said this was about building hate-free communities, uh, I felt, OK, I can talk a little bit about what's being done in my community. I wanted to go back, though, to uh, what you were talking about, the racism in this country and the civil rights movement. And I'll just say briefly, in 1962, I was 19 years old. Uh, I was a college student, and I went to North Carolina to do voter registration because African American people were not um, really being allowed to register to vote. And uh, also with a group of black and white college students, we did sit-ins at the public facilities because everything at that time was segregated. If you want to you know, wonder, did it do anything? Yes. Um, in North Carolina, everything was segregated from the hospitals to the cemeteries, to the churches, to the schools, to the restaurants. You could not walk into a restaurant, black and white, and sit together. Uh, you could not go to a baseball game uh, and sit in anything but the all-black section of the park. So yeah, there were, th there were things that got changed. Um, I also thought ab about the first speaker's comment about hate speech. and. Um, while it's, ap I agree totally that people have to be able to express those hateful things. Um, but when those Confederate flags started coming out, and uh, these Southerners will claim to you, for example, that the Confederate flag is part of their history and it doesn't, it's not racist, it doesn't mean anything. Those Confederate flags were not flying in the South until the Civil Rights Movement came. Suddenly, the, the Confederate flags were everywhere. And what those Confederate flags meant was hatred against blacks, hatred against civil rights workers, and they were scary. When you saw somebody with that Confederate flag, it was scary. And it could have been followed up by violence. Uh, there were people that came after us with knives. There were KKK people that were in the police departments. So, you know, it is a fine line sometimes between hate speech. I do think people have those rights, but um, I, di I, I digress. So after many years of acting nationally, internationally, etc., cetera, um, I finally decided to look around in my own community of Medford, which I'd lived in, I have now lived in for 38 years, and up until about seven or eight years ago, never really took the time to work in. So um, just to tell you a little bit about Medford, Medford's kind of an interesting community. It's about 70% white, Irish, Italian, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, it has a very uh, strongly rooted African-American community that goes back to the 19th century in West Medford that is extremely proud, very active, and part of the NAACP, which I am also a member of. It also has an increasing number of immigrants that are coming in, Haitians, uh, Brazilians in particular, Bangladeshi, um, some um, Middle Easterners. So, to make a very long story short, I, I started to want to do more in my own community. And um, my husband and I joined a Unitarian Universalist church in Medford. Uh, never thought as a Jewish, you know, Buddhist, socialist, feminist, whatever you call me. <laughs> uh, but the Unitarian Universalists kind of encompass everything uh, in a great big package. And um, I basically wanted to do some work in my community from a more spiritual and a less contentious uh, basis. And uh, for anybody here who's been involved in larger political activity, you know that can sometimes get kind of nasty and, and contentious. So. Um, it was very nice to be with this group of people that were trying to be mindful, kind, and uh, active at the same time. So first of all, our church networked with other churches in a group called the Refugee Immigration Ministry, which was helping asylum seekers and uh, refugees coming from all over, mainly from actually the Middle East and Africa, um, to find homes, uh, help them even pay their rent, to get hooked up with services, to, to, to get adjusted to life in America. 
And through that, uh, we made some really close friends, especially from Iraq and Rwanda, uh, where people were escaping war and genocide. And uh, that was a great gift. Um, we, we also began to get active in immigration rights issues. We joined with the Malden Unitarian Church and um, advocated with the New Sanctuary Movement. Uh, we hosted students from the Student Immigration Movement um, at our church. Uh, we also had people from Centro Presente, which you worked with. Uh, Patty Montes came and spoke at our church. Um, you know, which we opened up to the community. Um, so we were trying to bring immigration issues into the community. We've had um, two different uh, Muslim women speak, address our, our church. One, um, an Iraqi friend of mine who spoke about um, Islam as a peaceful religion, which a lot of people don't understand. She, was, she and her family had escaped from really the horrors of the Iraq war which uh, was a complete and total nightmare for her family. And um, we also had a Syrian woman who is a refugee talking about the situation in Syria. Um, we welcomed Muslims for a special event lunch at our church, and they in turn invited us to their mosques and then invited us to this really beautiful um, New England Muslim event where our um, our choir had sung a little song in uh, Arabic, so they were so appreciative, they invited us to this enormous event to sing um, in Arabic a welcoming song to them. But I mean, this is part, to me, this is part of the whole combating hatred um, issues. We also, with our minister, demonstrated at the State House in support of the SIM students, the student immigration students, who were fighting for in-state tuition at public college is an important issue. We hosted a GBLTQ film series for the community, and then we have continued to study racism and immigration in small book groups. And we put up a, a couple of years ago, two years ago, we put up, a, maybe three years ago, we put up a Black Lives Matter banner. And this has been very interesting, um, this Black Lives Matter banner. Um, it was torn down three times. Um, we recently had a rededication ceremony and put it up way up on the church where people couldn't get to it. <laughs> but um, more important than just putting up the banner was trying to explain within the community, why do we have this banner? Um, because, you know, in Medford, people who have Black Lives Matter pins or Black Lives Matter banners, people say, well, why do you have Black Lives Matter banners? You know, what's wrong with All Lives Matter? Okay, a question some of you might well be asking in this audience. And um, in fact, the VFW Hall in Medford put up a big All Lives Matter banner. Now, of course, we believe all lives matter. We're Unitarian Universalists. We believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. Why do we fly Black Lives Matter? Well, because in America, as my the speaker just said, black lives are not valued the same way life, white lives are ma matter. Uh, if, if I go through a red light as an old white lady, um, a police officer will come up to me and say, oh, you know, you did that, uh, maybe next time you won't. I won't be hauled off for having a broken tail light like Sandra Bland, a young African-American woman who was off to get a new job, was stopped for a broken tail light, hauled off to the police station, locked up in jail, and supposedly committed suicide in her jail cell. I do not for a minute believe that that's what happened. But anyway, um, it's absolutely true that black lives are not valued in America. Um, I could go on for all the different ways they're not. I did write a letter to the Medford Transcript trying to explain why do we have our Black Lives Matter banner. And I think we do need to, we do need to discuss these things within our community. So one of the things that has happened in Medford, which is really wonderful, although just to start, was we had Medford Conversations on Race, which many members of our church took part in. And it began with some people in our Human Rights Commission. And what we tried to do was to bring a variety of different kinds of people from Medford into a conversation about race and racial injustice and in small group discussions. So about 200 people took part in this. Uh, five different 
it's quite a commitment, actually. Five different small group discussions where we studied racism in a whole variety of ways. And people talked also about their own personal life experiences. And it did involve some people from the African American community. It involved immigrant students from our high school. It involved um, some students from Tufts. And it did involve some not enough of the traditional Medford community, but some of the people from my street, which is a kind of more traditional white old Medford street, did come and took part in these discussions. So um, part of this is a way to, um, a way to reach out. Um, and I think we have to do more of this kind of working in our communities, talking with each other. Um, it's, it's, it's painful. It's difficult. It's very easy to stereotype certain people as, oh, these are the Trump supporters. We can't possibly talk to them. I mean, I find it painful, but um, can't quite understand how anybody can do that. But um, out of these discussions, there was also an activist group that was called Safe Medford that was committed to making Medford a city where the police uh, did not collaborate with ICE. Uh, in other words, only if somebody had committed a major crime. They would not, they would not um, enforce the immigration laws. And we worked with our city council, we worked with our mayor, we worked with our chief of police, Sacco, who was actually a very decent guy. Um, who uh, is on the Human Rights Commission. And it looks like we have a statement, which they've said they've written up. I, as of this speaking, it has not yet been formally signed, so we've been waiting for that formal signature. But he's assured us that he has a statement now that the Medford police will not collaborate with ICE on these immigration raids which are happening. Um, so these are some of the things that you know we've been doing in Medford. Um, to be honest, this is just a start. We really have a lot, a lot of work to do. Um, I also, as I said, work in our local NAACP called the Mystic Valley NAACP, which actually includes a number of different communities, including Arlington, but um, is based, our meetings are based in West Medford and still is, has a sort of predominantly African-American group of the people who have come there for a very long time. And we've been working on issues like more diversity in hiring. For example, Medford High School um, has m many more immigrant students now. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the percentages are. Um, and many students of color, they have no teachers of color in the entire high school, which is kind of incredible. Um, but we now actually, um, as we speak, we may be on the cusp of hiring a terrific Haitian American woman who is committed to diversity as our new superintendent of schools. I know that she is one of the two finalists. She is actually the most qualified of the two by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> she, uh, and she's also totally charming and experienced uh, as an administrator. So I'm crossing my fingers that by two weeks from now, we will have uh, our very first uh, person of color in any position of um, influence in the whole entire city of Medford. Um, so, you know, just to say, um, it's really, it's really kind of uh, important, I think, in these, to me, very dark political times. Very hate-filled, very angry, but I think it's very important to work in communities, to build ties, to surround yourself with people who are kind and caring and humane people, um, even if their political beliefs might be a little different from yours, um, because we, 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 really, really, we really need to do this. Um, so at this moment, as I have reached the age of 75, <laughs> I can't quite believe it, but, um, and have become less active um, uh, at the last march on the common, I and three of my old lady friends went, we did not, we just could not march from Roxbury all the way to the Common. I had just sprained my ankle and other people had bad feet. So we said, we're gonna just go to the Common and wait till the marchers come from Madison Park High School. And many people from, younger people from our church did join that march, which was, if any of you were out there, it was absolutely beautiful, the March for Our Lives. And it was 
the African American students kind of in the lead at Madison Park coming through and then meeting up with all kinds of people. And the speakers were all, as you probably know, students. Um, they did not want any politicians. They just wanted the students to speak. Um, there were some of the students from the high school you know, where the shooting occurred. Um, I think it was the sister of one of the people who was killed who was kind of sobbing through her whole speech. But um, it was really beautiful. And I feel like something is happening now with the younger generation. So I feel very heartened. And I'm also very heartened. My last comment, since I always have to be a little bit um, controversial, um, I was very heartened that people are signing up to registering to vote. Because when I was an activist, I kind of had written off the electoral process completely. But there were people registering to vote, 18-year-olds now registering to vote. Uh, my grandchildren are 18, and they're going to be able to register. They're going to be able to vote in the next election. But yeah, and they marched. Um, but I, I think it's very important to take part in the political process. And um, there is a clear choice between the two political parties. I'm not going to tell you which is which. But one party is the party of inclusion, hope, and saving our social safety net, Medicare and Medicaid. The other is promoting hate, anti-immigrant sentiments, and tax cuts for the millionaires. And I'll just leave it to you to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great words, great speech. And, um, so I, I don't know where to start, but maybe I will start by asking how many of you are students of North Shore Community College? Woohoo! Great. <clears throat> and the reason I want to start with that is because I always feel home when I, when I come to the college, sometimes because life and different things that I will share with you a little bit about that keep me away, but I always feel coming home, even though I was saying it's growing a little bit. Hopefully, it will keep the spirit than when the college was a little smaller. Uh, and, 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 and the reason is pretty simple. Um, I spend uh, nine years coming, not every day, but almost every day, because I was a student here. Uh, from the very beginning stage of taking ESL classes, moving to take some regular classes. I always remember a beautiful program. I don't know, it's still alive. Um, I don't remember the name, actually, at this specific moment, but it was so beautiful that it was kind of like introductory to regular classes. And Project Enable was called. And I always say when my son asked me, Dad, I am going to be taking the ACT. How do, you do that? How do you do that? And I said, I have no idea. I graduated from college, but I, don't, I have no idea because I never took it. I said, I was taking ESL classes, and eventually I went to a program, and I was allowed to take regular classes. And nine years later, I, gra I was graduating with an associate degree of paralegal. So I said, I have no idea how I do the ACT. I don't know. But so. It is always nice to come back home. And the other thing I want to share with you is that I, I, I think it, I have been kind of like a privilege, with, you know, and I have enjoyed my time here in the US. I came in actually in 1998. So um, just last April 3rd, I was turning 20 years here in the United States. I came undocumented as many of my fellow uh, Im recent immigrants, and um, as many of you uh, with dreams, you know, going to college, having a job, uh, making some money to help my family and my, my little sisters in El Salvador. But when I came here, I also not only started taking classes and doing jobs like cleaning offices, uh, delivering milk from Garalak Farm, I think it's somewhere around here. So. Uh, so I have done different type of jobs. Um, and, and that not only, not only has allowed me to be supporting of my family in El Salvador, but also my family here. I, I, I have three kids born here in the United States. One actually is 17. This is the one that is taking the ICT, actually, this coming Saturday. I have also a 12-year-old daughter. And I have a three-year-old boy 
and actually a girl who's going to be coming to the world on July 15. So, <laughs> celebrations at home. You poor thing. Yeah. <laughs> Keep me busy. <laughs> but then, on the other side, also, because I came and documented, and I, and I am originally from El Salvador, and actually, I haven't had the opportunity to apply for something that is called permanent immigration status, or somebody will say, you should apply for citizenship. I wish that would be that easy. I will have it done a long time ago, but um, he here we are. So when we're talking about hate, I just want to come back to that specific, and how, how can we build hate-free spaces? And I think it, I just want to make sure that I, I, I'm explaining this. Through my job and through my personal life, I see how hate get transformed into a specific, for example. In my job, I work, I work as a paralegal. I work as a legal program coordinator for an organization that provides legal support to worker centers. This means mostly low-wage workers, and many of them undocumented. I can see how hate has been around, but I can easily see how, since last presidential elections, has increased. And this has been transformed in this way, for example, Usually we have phone calls from undocumented workers who went to do a job. And at the end, when they finish the job, sometimes they don't get paid. But they get treated with things like, if you can bring me your documents, I will pay you. But that question didn't happen at the beginning until the job was done. That's the question that usually come back. If you bring me real documents, I'll pay you. But this is what is happening after the last election is like, and you have to stop calling me because if not, I'm going to call immigration. That's kind of like, that's how we are seeing what's going on right now. And that is happening more often than it was happening in previous year. The other thing too, I think a lot of people are feeling more empowered to do things like that because some people feel that they have more support. But the other thing that is also at hitting me home is something that is uh, going on right now within the whole immigration debate is the, I don't know how many of you have heard about temporary protective status. Temporary protective status, very many people talk about TPS, that's how people paraphrase it, is a program that the US government use and give to countries that suffer natural disasters. And many countries, uh, there are about 10 countries who are under this program, including El Salvador. El Salvador was giving TPS to Salvadorians that were here in the United States undocumented in 2002 when the big earthquake happened in El Salvador and the country was not safe and therefore we were giving a temporary protective status to be working. The TPS allowed you to work and you stay here, but it doesn't allow you to move forward to a permanent situation. So what is going on right now is that for the last 17 years, TPS was renewed because of different situations the countries have, are facing, and the countries are not ready to receive close to 200,000 people under TPS. So last, a few months ago, he was told, everyone from El Salvador was told that this is the last time that the TPS will be renewed. So that means, in my case, I have been in the U.S. for the last 20 years. I have been under TPS for the last 17. I have been growing a family who are U.S. citizen kids, and I have learned English, I guess. I also have been doing things in the right way, but here I am, by 2019, I will become undocumented if nothing happened from now to September. So that is when I see hate going on, transforming real. The question is, what are we doing? What are we gonna do? And I think that's the challenge I have for you. And some of us that face these things every day, most of the time we are doing something. In my case, I go to work, and then I also participate in local organizations. And I am organizing, for example, I don't know if you have heard about Massachusetts TPS Committee, which is a group of people with TPS that are organizing 
and working at the same time with other national groups to hopefully pass a legislation that will protect people under TPS. And TPS is not only for Salvadorians, it's also for Haiti. They have about 50,000 people from Haiti are protected by TPS. Nepal has about 10,000 people protected by TPS. Honduras has about 60,000 people with TPS. And El Salvador, about 200,000. So we are organizing because our families are at risk. We are organizing, and not only, and, 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 and this is kind of like sometimes it's very confusing for some people. Say, poor immigrants. It is true we are facing the reality, but it's also true that we are part of a community. And if immigrants or blacks are getting affected, your community is also suffering, especially if you have a heart that you care about your neighbor. So I think that's the challenge for some of you. I am sure if you are here, it's because you are active. So the question is, are you willing to take the next steps? For example, I will give you a few things. For example, for example, there are groups that are doing community organizing. For example, I, I know ECHO is very active, raising the minimum wage, passing the, 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 uh, the, uh, the ballot initiative. I know Jobs No jobs Jail. Not. There are organizations like Neighbor to Neighbor locally here in Lynn. There are other organizations that are doing immigration work. Can you support those organizations? And then sometimes, and this is about the politic thing, and I think at this one, I really believe that you need to get engaged in the political system. I do believe that you don't have to get confused about political parties. Because at the end of the day, you can elect somebody, but if you don't do any follow-up, nothing will happen, and that's very common in Massachusetts. Many people say Massachusetts is very progressive. Yes, it's true in some things, but it's, it is also very bad in some other. And when it comes to immigration, it's not that great, let me tell you. Driver license for undocumented immigrants, people have been fighting for this for years. Other states, there are about 12 other states that do have and provide driver license for undocumented. In state tuition for undocumented immigrants, people have been fighting in Massachusetts for years. We don't have it. It is surprising, but Texas do have it. Whether Texas is better than Massachusetts, I'm not saying it. What I am saying is about in-state tuition. Texas do have in-state tuition, but not Massachusetts. So, you know, I just want to throw that for us to be, and for you that are U.S. citizen and registered to vote, be intentional with that. Let's elect people, but also let's follow up. So how many of you have you called your representative when you hear about issues? Do you call your representative? When, for example, I know, for example, Congress Malton is here in, the, in, in, in our area. Can you make a phone call and say, Congressman, I heard something about TPS. Are you taking, are you taking a step? You know, that is something probably small but I can make a difference in many people's life. And there is a lot of stuff you can do, and I am sure you already know, and that's why you are here. This is one, probably the beginning, and maybe just, or maybe just a continuation of your life of activism and everything, but at the end of the day, when somebody's suffering, I think the labor movement has that. If somebody's suffering, we all are suffering. So I think we need to take actions, and that's kind of like the challenge. So we do have time for questions, and we do have a couple of microphones here. Um, would somebody be able to help with the microphones and getting them to people? That would be great. Um, and so what I'd ask you to do is um, to raise your hand to ask the question, and then also ask who you'd like to direct it to. Hi, thank you very much. I want to gather my thoughts before I ask a question, but I have a quick comment that just tags on to what you were saying. I felt like I was doing a lot and then started joining with some of ECHO's actions. And for anyone who is here April 19th, there is a rally. Um, please look to ECHO on Facebook. There are maybe 20 other organizers uh, sponsoring this March for Immigrant Families at the State House March rally, delivering letters, walking right in. So please look to ECHO for a number. And I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, but they are one of just some of the amazing organizations in the area. Thanks. Thank you. 
Um, yes, just to, so there's a training that's gonna, there's a training that's happening, a part of it started today and a part of it tomorrow. Um, it's um, Temple Beth Israel um, in Boston for, um, it's an active bystander training that ECHO is, is running because one of the things that we've decided to do um, with this march is what is called um, um, active disobedience. And that is, um, a major piece of that is we intend to block the entrance to the governor's office. Um, sometime in the summer, I, I led a march to the, governor's man, to the governor's house, I was gonna say mansion, to the governor's house <laughs> in Swampscott. Um, and we were stopped by the police midway on our way to delivering something to the, gov to the governor. Um, but we are in marching to the state house and because the state house belongs to us, we are able to block the entrance. And what that means is that there might be some people that will uh, be arrested um, because of that. And some of us, including myself, have made the decision that if this is what it takes, this is what we're gonna do. Um, and so please, April 19th, please support as much as you possibly can. Thank you. Other questions? I'm not adept with these. Is this the right distance? Can, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I am so glad that I'm here. I'm so glad and grateful that you're here. One of the many things that's going through my head is I'm not really sure that I know very much about what hate is. I'm not sure I want to. I think it might be something like smoking. It's kind of an expensive bad habit, but people wouldn't do it if they didn't get something out of it. And I'm wishing that there was a panel at some point where people who used to hate and knew what they got out of it um, left that way of thinking and whatever um, reinforcements they got and, and how they made the transition. Um, my dad used to smoke, and what he did was to do something else instead. He chewed gum like a fanatic. And I'm wondering, what would, what would, what would hate, what, what would hate give you if, if that was something that was in your mind? I'm thinking, well, I would feel better than other people. That would be something that would inform my thinking, and I, that might give me some confidence. And I think that another piece of this. Um, is the violence. We're, we're not looking about the violence. If I had to live in fear that somebody hated me and they might do violence to me, that would be really, really frightening. And if someone hated and felt justified in committing violence, I don't know how theoretical this is. I mean, I think that what does hate look like? But my question would be is what, what could people, how could people make the transition if People are fed by feeling that others are less than. How? Thank you. I, th I think we have your question, so I'm going to let uh, Susan take a crack at that. Well, I think I wouldn't make the complete analogy with smoking, but I think um, I um, what I think part of hate is ignorance of other people. You know, just not knowing, and that's been shown that when people actually get to know an immigrant, an African-American, really a Jew, it often really changes. And I heard on NPR about a wonderful organization. You might Google it, and I don't know where, I forget where it's located, called Life After, Life After Hate. And it's run by a man who used to be a white supremacist himself as a young man. And he works with these young kids who have become white supremacists, many of whom, almost all of whom, had traumatic childhoods. I mean, not to justify it, but they, their, their fathers abandoned them or one thing or another happened to them. And 
so he, he talked about how he works with these kids. And at least on the NPR article, he listens. First of all, he listens to them. He listens to their own personal stories and grievances of their lives and spent some time doing that. Then, after he's worked with them for a while in that way, he meets them up with the group that he happens that they happen to think they hate, you know, whether it be he invites them to a dinner with a black family or an immigrant family, or you know, it sounds kind of corny, but um, according to this NPR piece, at least, he has an enormous success rate in turning these people around. And as I said, he himself was one of these young kids. A lot of kids who are unhappy in their own lives. Um, turn to these groups, you know, and again, this maybe sounds simplistic, but um, you asked how do people deal with hate, and I think one way people deal with hate is getting to know people of different cultures, different ethnicities, different backgrounds as human beings, I really do. So. And, and if I may, if I, if I may um, we, we all have implicit biases. We all have them. Um, a real quick story I shared when we ran, when we were able, ECHO was able to, um, to run an implicit bias training with the Lynn Police Department. I remember I was in the um, Northeastern University area. I was looking for a particular building, and I, for whatever reason, I, I, I got a little bit lost. I parked my car and I got out. And there were two groups, it was so funny, there were two groups of, in, um, of, of young men. One group had about four to five, four or five um, young men. Um, and another group, there was about three of them. And one group was, um, there was like three Caucasian male, um, an Asian, and I think the other one was um, Hispanic. But they were well-dressed, well, neatly dressed. You could tell, or I could tell, or thought, that they were you know, college students. The other group was a group of black boys, and they were dressed, you know, one had a durag on, which I wear every single night, but one had a durag on, um, you know, they, their, they, their pants were not buckled at their waist, and, and whatever. And I wanted to, ask for the building. And in that moment, me, a black man from Jamaica who wears Durag, found myself terrified of approaching the group of black boys. And I had to ask myself in that moment, why? There was nothing that they were doing that suggested that they were dangerous or a threat in any way, but my implicit bias against my own race crippled me in that moment from going. And as I, as I felt myself headed toward the other group, I stopped myself in the moment, turned around, and went back to those boys. We all have our implicit biases. What we, what we should do is ask ourselves why we have those biases, where they came from. And that is, I believe, the first step in identifying the hatred in, our, in us, because we, we have them, and how we're able, we're going to be able to tackle those. Yeah. So reading an article that I don't remember where the article came from, but it was kind of like making an analysis about especially the, uh, the US. And, um, and I remember something that it says in the US is very well used in order to keep power a few things. One is scarcity. There is always a message that there is not enough. That is not enough. And then there is another one that is fear. And sometimes those things are used very well, and that's, I think, is when, like, you know, kind of like building hate comes in order to divide communities. Uh, there is always that idea that there is not enough, and that sometimes either black or Latinos or whatever minority groups are, are taken away from the other group that are in power. When in reality, if we really see it, that's not true. There is enough. It is true that people in the bottom are making less money, but it's also true that billionaires are making billions, that if that money were distributed, there will be enough for everybody. But sometimes we get confused. And fear, fear is that message that we heard. I am sure that if you Google Fox News about Salvadorians TPS, they won't tell you that there is somebody with TPS from North Shore Community College who graduated and has been in the US for 20 years never has been arrested and, and instead has been helping to pass laws that raise minimum wage for everyone, not only for Salvadorians. You won't find that. 
but you, won't fi you will find that Salvadorians DPS or Salvadorians are MS-13. See how fear is used? So I think that in order to come back when you're thinking something, probably is to inform yourself, because most likely you are getting misinformed depending where your information is coming from. So I think in my, in my political activities, in my community activities, I have come to understand that what I see on the TV actually sometimes is not true. And I will probably say 95% depending what channel and what side of the island you are and getting your information, that's what eventually comes getting into your mind and you start thinking sometimes even without understanding that you actually are hurting yourself. Like I am sure many people right now are suffering because they election decision and who they vote for, but at that specific moment they were so using hate at a specific moment that they, they weren't like really you know, bad decision, but now I am sure they are suffering the results. So sometimes, you know, information and depending where we're getting can make us blind, and sometimes we ended up affecting ourselves. So remember, scarcity and fear is used to divide just for a, a specific group to keep the power. That's a very interesting area to continue looking forward and working on it. Thank you. Other questions? I. Hi, um, my name is Mary Malone, and I teach here at North Shore Community College. And I want to thank everybody for your examples. And I just want to say that me, as you know, a white Irish Catholic woman, it's like sometimes I feel like I can't even come to the table, to the discussion. Um, and that's a different kind of fear. And I guess I have to get over that fear. Um, and I also want to say I had a similar experience. I actually got pulled over right in front of North Shore Community College, my place of employment, last Saturday. And um, I had a taillight problem. And um, I didn't know what to do. And you know, you're hearing about these incidences. So I said, I'm going to do what they tell you to do. So I put my hands up, and I told the police officer, I'm, I'm going to reach into my glove box to get my registration. And, and then they went back to their car, and I said, what's the matter? And they said, we can't tell you that. And they went back to their car, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm right in front of my place of employment. Um, and I had my hands up just waiting, and, uh, and the officer got a little chippy, and you know, the people in the car with me said, well, why are you doing that? And I said, well, if other people in our community have to, then I have to. And that was my very recent experience, but you know, I am suffering from the fear of not being active. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, so um, I came from Jamaica last year, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I find it hard to adjust to a country where there's separation between black or white or ethnic groups. And I'm asking you, like, how were you able to be stable or to adjust to this surrounding? Is that for me? Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was difficult. I remember when I um, first came here, the first six months, well, within the first six weeks, I had to be put on as a Tyler prom, because I was just, my, I, I wasn't coping. Um, I was in physical pain. My skin was breaking out. My, I, was, I, was, I was traumatized. Um, I don't have on my car a Jamaican flag or a flag of any other country. I don't have any kind of memorabilia that tells that I'm, I'm from a different country. And my wife and I would be driving, and somebody wants to cut us off, or my wife isn't driving fast enough, and we would be told, go back to your country, or get out of here. And I'm like, how do you know we're from a different country? Like, there's nothing that tells. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was very difficult. I, I, I consider myself blessed in that the first church that I was called to serve here was a predominantly Caribbean church and more so Jamaican than anything else. So that group of individuals became my family. But then 
my wife, who was here a year and a half before me, knew of North Shore Community College. And I was a very active, very involved person back home. And just sitting at home for two weeks, doing nothing, was enough to drive me crazy. And so my wife introduced me to North Shore Community College. And I met, and I believe this with all of my heart, one of the best human beings on earth, Maggie Labella. <laughs> and I do not say that. I love you, Maggie. I do not say that because she's sitting here. I genuinely believe that. Um, but I met Maggie. I got enrolled in her class. And uh, through the direct support certificate program, I started getting exposed to the, 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 the culture here at North Shore Community College and started meeting other people. And um, little by little, I, I, my, my circle was expanding. I was still suffering or struggling with um, being marginalized because of the color of my skin. And I say, that, I say to you, 10 years later, I still suffer that. Um, about two years ago, I was driving to church one, sun, one Saturday evening to my godson's birthday party. And the sticker on my car was expired, but I, I had renewed the registration online, and they were supposed to send the sticker in the mail. It didn't get, I, it didn't come. The police in Peabody pulled me over. Um, and he said to me, did you know this is an arrestable offense? And I said, sir, I did not know that. He said, well, you're going to know that today. And he pulled me out of my car. Sitting beside me was one of my dearest friends, Miss Barbara, who's here with me. And the police looked across to Barbara, and he said to her, ma'am, do you mind driving this car home? And I said to him, wait, wait, wait. Why are you arresting me again? He said, because you're, you should not be driving a car with an expired registration sticker. I said, but you have no problem asking her to drive the car home. It's OK for her to drive it home, but I get arrested for driving it. Um, and so I, I, I mentioned that to say I still deal with the marginalization. Um, however, one of the things that I learned real quickly is that, one, you have to expand your circle. Um, you have to, you're in a new country. You're in a different country. And as I've said earlier, we don't know what black versus white is. However, that is the reality of where we're living today. There's black and there's white. And trust me, you're black. And it is known that you're black. However, you have to now get to understand others. You have to get to understand the culture of others. You have to now uh, 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 immerse yourself into the, to the American culture by selecting um, friends, getting involved in various organizations. Get involved. And let me tell you something. I've been to more colleges and universities in my life than I think anybody else. This is an awesome, awesome school. At least it was when I was here, and I still believe it is today, um, when it comes on to campus life, when it comes on to getting involved in organizations, when it comes on to getting um, involved in various kind of off-campus projects and stuff. North Shore Community, I owe a debt of gratitude to North Shore Community College. And that was one of the things that helped me through. I, I, I would be happy to, to talk with you. I'd be happy to switch um, trade numbers and, 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 and keep the conversation going. All right. Thank you. We still have a little bit of time left for another question or two, if anybody has one. Yes. So I, I'd like to get back to that idea of just becoming active, because I think that people feel like they need to do something. And some people have time to start teaching an English class, because they're always looking for volunteers. They need people to do things. There are actions. But you're also talking about inform, being more informed. And so one of the things that we've talked about in Salem is just stopping the conversation of people using the term illegal or illegals, and 
just stopping to explain that and thinking of those simple acts of language and what we can do. So I was hoping that you could share if you had pieces that you would like to send us away with that we can do that don't take a great deal of time but can be transformative. If you, if you had anything to share along those lines, please. Is that for me? Oh, for, for any of the three of you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think if we're talking about a, a very broad uh, topic here, but when it comes to the immigration, if you know, if it's something that um, some of you are interested in, for sure, I can, I can share a lot of information, and also I can share organizations that are really focused and doing work when it comes to the immigration area. But I think when it comes to welcoming spaces, when it comes to uh, talking and getting to know other communities. Sometimes I am sure in some of your neighborhood, maybe just a community meeting within your neighbor can be actually something that it may sound small, but it can actually move forward. I give you one example. People, people that have been with TPS and also people that have been under temporary programs in Massachusetts have been getting for many, many years, driver license for five years, as everyone else. Starting this year, last March, actually was something was implemented that is going to make anybody who is using or who is here in a temporary program like myself to get driver license only with the time that these work authorizations will be allowed to be in the U.S. So that means for example, if the work authorization gets renewed for one year, that's the only time that you're going to get, that's the only time you will be getting driver license. And that actually is something that Governor Charlie Baker can change with one decision. And I bring that to this conversation because I am sure some of you live Swenska, Marblehead, with a few phone calls from his, na from his neighbors can make a big difference. Will he do it? Maybe not but at least we'll be open to some conversations. So I think it, things like that can be very, uh, and I would be happy to share more information and also put you in contact with organizations, share with you materials. For example, right now there are a few big campaigns going on and it not, will not only help immigrants or undocumented immigrants, but every worker in Massachusetts. The first share amendment is something like anybody who make more than $1 million for whatever is making over $1 million, probably should be able to pay 4% more on the, on the taxes. And that money will help everybody, everybody. Uh, and that will help, for sure, immigrants. Sure, every worker who's making $11, why not raise the minimum wage to 15 That will help. But sometimes, you know, I, and I just come back to the hate conversation, and sometimes it gets divided, and sometimes we forget about small things that can make a difference for everybody, for everybody else, because sometimes the idea is that those illegals, those immigrants, those blacks don't deserve to make more because they should be going to college or things like that. So I think things like that, but I will be happy to share more information, but, you know, I would just throw in some small things that people can do and get active on it. Yeah, I, one of the things that Safe Medford is doing right now is getting a training. We're, we're getting a training ourselves on how to talk. I'm not going to try to do it here, but how to talk to people about the immigration issue. There are a lot of different ways that are helpful and ways that are not helpful. I mean, there's certain phrases like bringing people out of the shadows, which are not helpful phrases. And, you know, the people use, even well-meaning people use that sometimes, you know, because it, it connotes something really scary. I, I can't go through it on that, but there are people out there who are training people to understand. I also think with my students, when I was still teaching, I had them do research papers on their own immigrant backgrounds. And what they found when they did that, which I knew they would, was that every single group of immigrants, the Irish, for example, were, you know, t were treated like dogs and Irish not allowed, Irish need not apply. Um, Irish were not even considered white at a certain period of our nation's history. Um, people who came from Canada who were French Canadians had all kinds 
kinds of horrible names, you know, that they were called. They learned that their ancestors were immigrants. Unfortunately, they did not have the, and with my ancestors, my Jewish ancestors, there was no legal or illegal. Anybody who wanted to come to this country could come. And um, all you had to do was not have some serious infectious disease and something like $20, and you were in there at Ellis Island. So this whole thing about illegals and, Ill and legals didn't apply. There was no such thing. And so um, I think, you know, there's different ways of approaching it, but, you know, people have been talking about this. It's too, too long a discussion, but there are ways to talk to people about immigration to make them understand it in a more compassionate light, also to understand what is going on in countries like El Salvador, you know, with drug violence and, um, you know, people being kidnapped and people, all kinds of horrible things happening to people that um, people just don't know about. You know, why are people coming here? You know, it's not to steal your jobs. <laughs> and I'll say for me, um, quickly, get involved use your iPhones. The world information is right at our fingertips right now. Use your iPhones, get on social media, get involved. If you don't know, there's, there, there, there's a ton of organizations all of, popping up all over these, the, the, this country that is for one cause or the other. Go to City Hall, get a listing of all the organizations that are there, Look, t take your phone out, call them, find out what their causes are, Get involved. Get involved. Do not wait to do not wait to do what we see is happening across the country right now, where congressmen and senators, rather than standing up and fighting back, they are retiring or not seeking re-election and then speak after the fact. Get involved. That's the best way. Just have conversation with people. You'd be surprised to know just what is happening. Real quickly, and I'm going to shut up. I learned, um, I learned at a meeting recently with the Lynn Police Department that when ICE is coming for a raid in the city of Lynn, ICE calls the Lynn Police Department and they say, we are coming to pick up John Bull at um, 275 Essex Street. You know what the Lynn Police Department does? They go to 275 Essex Street, they arrest John Bull, bring John Bull to the Lynn Police Department, have him sit there, wait for ICE to come, and then when ICE comes, nobody knows after what happens to John Bull. You have the authority. A the, the power of the people is greater than the people in power. You have the authority to call your police department, call your city hall, find out what is happening in your city, and get involved. Thank you. And let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Laurie Carlson up to tell us about our next Forum on Tolerance. So thank you so much again to all of our panelists today, um, as well as Attorney Joe Berman. You're, they're all wonderful. So I just wanted to um, have you save the date for our Fall Forum on Tolerance. Uh, this one's an exciting one. We're collaborating with both the American Association of University Women and the White Privilege Institute. Uh, the topic that so far is uh, race, power, and privilege building allies. It will be a two-day training happening in the 19th and 20th of October right here in Lynn. Um, we are a community college, we can't afford really expensive speakers, but the White Privilege Institute can, so they're funding some of our speakers. So far we know we're having Chuck Collins speak. You might not know about him, um, he was the heir to the Oscar Mayer Wiener for Fortune, and he gave up his money to become a philanthropist. So we'll have some exciting speakers, but just save those dates, October 19th and 20th of 2018, and thank you all so much for coming.